What were the skills that made you a successful fundraiser? I mean, having a decent idea and a good team to start, if you don't have those things, you might be able to raise the money, but you'll never be successful. Being able to communicate to investors very clearly what the, the value proposition is, you know, why it matters, what's different about what you're trying to do, what your plans and ambitions are, and ultimately, you know, what's in it for them. So how do you identify new technologies to invest in? I look for two things. Is, is the technology cool? And can you get rich? Welcome. My name is Daniel Gerlay and I'm the president of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society. The Global Young Entrepreneur Society is an international organization that supports exceptional young people in achieving entrepreneurial growth. My guest today is Professor Bill O'Farrell of Columbia Business School. Bill is a 30-year veteran of the startup world. Most recently, he was co-founder and CEO of Body Labs Inc., a computer vision and AI company focused on 3D human body modeling. Body Labs was acquired by Amazon in 2017. Formerly, Bill was co-founder and CEO of such companies as Speechworks, acquired by Nuance, OpenAir.com, acquired by NetSuite, and a company of science and art, which created the After Effects product line acquired by Adobe. Bill is an adjunct professor at the Columbia Business School, where he teaches launcher startup. Bill received his undergraduate degree from Brown University and a JD from Harvard Law School. I am pleased to welcome Professor Bill O'Farrell. Very pleased to be here, Daniel. And that was uh, the most accurate introduction I've ever had. So thank you. It's great to have you on. Why did you decide to leave law to become a tech entrepreneur? I decided to leave law because I didn't like it. Um, I actually went to law school thinking, as was advised by many people at the time, that you know law was a, a good education to have. And so I sort of, without ha having a very clear idea of what else I wanted to do, I figured it, it, it wouldn't be a waste of time. It would be a good thing to do. But I neither liked law school, nor did I like the practice of law. So I knew I had to leave. And I did that pretty quickly. I only practiced for a year and a half. But in point of fact, I didn't aim to be a tech entrepreneur. I actually quit my law job. I was working in California. This was 1989 or 90. I actually quit my law job with an idea of um, moving from California. This is all in the US, obviously, um, back to the East Coast where I'd grown up and um, starting a chain of microbreweries for beer. Because at the time, microbreweries, uh, brew pubs were a kind of a new phenomenon and they were very big out in the West Coast, but they really hadn't, hadn't been established on the East Coast. And I thought, well, it'd be great to put one of these in each college town along the Eastern seaboard where there's a big set of colleges. Um, and for a lot of reasons, uh, I mean, idea started to go forward, but, but, but while I was in the midst of that, I met a couple of people who went to the same university I did who had started a software company and they needed some business help. And, you know, frankly, that looked like a, a little better of an idea than mine, um, a little easier to manage. So um, I signed on with them to do, to run the business, to be CEO of that company, which was the company that, that made this product called After Effects. I sort of, so I kind of backed into being a tech entrepreneur. And then once we sold the company to Adobe, by that point, I, I guess that was, I guess I'd run the company for about three years I sort of understood a lot more about software. I understood a lot more about technology and I had a little bit of, you know, reputational success with that. So that enabled me to start the next company. What were the skills that made you a successful fundraiser? I mean, having, you know, a decent idea and a good team, you know, as a start, if you don't have those things, you might be able to raise the money, but you'll never be successful. Um, you know, I mean, you, you know, you need, you need, you need, you need to have those things. But I think communication. I think that's as CEO probably the most important skill someone has to have. So being able to communicate to, in this case, you asked about fundraising, being able to communicate to investors very clearly what the the value proposition is. You know, why it matters. What's different about what you're trying to do. What your plans and ambitions are, and ultimately, you know, what's in it for them. So I think almost invariably when people say, you know, what, what's the most important skill as a CEO, I almost always say communication and I think communication skills. And I think, I think that's certainly 
the key thing that I, I think I can bring to the table when it comes to, to, to raising money. And I think the other thing that, that really helps is, you know, when you're raising money, particularly for an early stage company, you don't always have all the answers, right? I mean, because there's so much that you don't know as you're going forward. But I think being able to also communicate to investors that you've at least identified the questions that are going to need to be answered down the road is quite an important thing. So, so, so that you have thought through and can anticipate the questions and then, and then go gather the information to eventually be able to answer them. Do you have any advice on how to improve your communicational skills? One thing about communication skills, I think, is, 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 is improving your listening skills. You know, because if you reflect um, and understand what people are asking you, you know, if you take the time to listen to what they're asking you, then you can at least answer the question that you've been asked. Um, a lot of times people just, you know, start talking and they don't listen very well. So I think good communication starts with good listening. And I think if you listen long enough and hard enough in enough situations, you can begin to anticipate what information needs to be communicated in a general sense. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've run enough of these companies now that I've heard enough questions from investors, from customers, from employees that I at least now have a pretty good starting point as to, okay, well, here's the general information you need. Now, what else would you like me to tell you? And let me listen to you first before I start answering. Many of these companies you started were developing something completely new. So how do you identify new technologies to invest in? Well, I, I will answer this in a slightly facetious way, and then I'll try to answer it more specifically. So for me personally, I, I look for two things. Is, is the technology cool? And can you get rich? And I, I'm being slightly, what I mean by that is for me, like, you know, there's a lot of ways that people can make money, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of, particularly even in the, in the, in the startup, you know, the technology world, there's lots of things that you can bring new technology to, to, to sell things in a different way, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, they're not, if it's not really kind of pushing the envelope, if it's not something, you know, really new, um, if it's not cool, and, you know, even if you can get rich, it's just not that much fun, you know, and, but then there are a lot of things that are super cool, like, you know, new technologies, but it's very hard to make a business out of them. They're very far in the future, or even though they're, you know, interesting intellectually, they don't necessarily have a direct way of commercializing them. So I think those things should stay in research and academia, at least until they gestate or they, they develop long enough to have a commercial application. So what I do is, you know, I try to do the following. I try to I spend a lot of time talking to professors and graduate, postdoctorate and graduate students at university research institutions, you know, places like um, MIT, Columbia, where I teach, NYU, Cornell, the Max Planck Institute, which is, uh, was, a, you know, Body Labs, my last company was a spinoff there, um, Brown, where I went to university. And I talked to lots of professors, lots of graduate students about, you know, all this cool stuff that's happening. And then I try to find really good world-class scientific or technical partners. So, so it's because you need, you need to really have really smart technical people whose judgment you trust as far as the technology goes. And then I try to match up with them to make, you know, if there's, a, and then if there's a, if it's, if it's a really cool technology and there's a good market application or big potential market, um, that to me is what I look for in general. And then I try to try to match that with, with great technical partners. How much technical skills necessary to build and lead a tech startup? So I have none. I was a history major. I was a lawyer <laughs> and I've been running software companies for 30 years. You know, I think it really depends at this point. I, you know, I understand how a software company or, you know, a tech company in general develops, but I, I, I think that there's, you know, a couple of important ingredients into a start into a tech startup. One is obviously the technology. And so somebody needs to be a technical expert. That doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO, though, because I think the other two things are sort of, you know, kind of whatever you want to call it, marketing or product development, you know, there's marketing sales product, and then there's the financial piece. So really, I kind of think of it in as a three-legged stool, you know, you have to, you have to have the tech, you have to have the product and marketing and sales, and then you have to have the finance in place to, to fund those things. And I think if you're really good at one of them, you can run the company. I don't, as, as long as you've got people who are really good at the other ones who are your trusted partners. So now that said, there's a lot of, you know, I look, I think if, 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 if you've got an engineering background and, and you're starting a, a high tech company, that probably helps. 
you know, it helps you assess the technology a lot better. The other thing I might say is that I think having what, you know, what I would call domain expertise is, is important as well. And again, if, if, if you don't have domain expertise, but you've got somebody you can bring into the company who does, you know, that's important. And, and, and what I mean by that is probably the single biggest issue at, in, in, in any startup is really identifying the problem that exists before you even create the solution. So if you come from an industry and you know that you've been in this industry for a while and you know, wow, this is a big, big problem that we haven't been able to solve yet, or we need a new way or a better way to solve it. That's like the vital information for every startup is what's the problem you're solving. So if you come with domain expertise, you can, you know, then partner with a really great technical person and a, you know, maybe a good finance person and, 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 and that will bring the, 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 the startup together. How do you find partners who you can build the startup with? Well, I always say when I'm looking for a new venture, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your 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 prince charming or your princess charming. You took Speechworks public in 2000. The stock tripled its value. At one point, the stock was $100 a share. And at another point, I think the stock went down to $3 a share. What education will best prepare someone to become a tech entrepreneur? Entrepreneurialism is many times much more about personality than it is per se about education. How do you find partners who you can build the startup with? Well, I always say when I'm looking for a new venture, you, you have to kiss a lot of frogs, um, which is, you know, before you find your 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 prince charming or your princess charming, it, it takes a long time. I think I think finding partners and and developing partnerships is, you know, is is not something that happens overnight. One needs to find very smart people. Um, but actually, funnily enough, that's that's not the hardest part. The hardest part are are really two things I think that are vital. One is can you trust this person's judgment? And that doesn't mean like, can you trust them ethically or what? It just means if they're a technical, for me, if they're a technical person, if I present the business problems that need to be solved when we're hoping to solve it with this technology, can I trust their judgment that they can make the technology do the things that, that, that need to be done to address the business problems? Because sometimes the technology is really cool, but you know, you can't make it work in the, on on a certain type of computer or on a phone or you know it takes too much memory or it takes too long so you need to be able to trust that 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 their assessment of what they can make the technology do is one you can rely on i mean for me it's important because i'm not technical so i need to i need them to tell me yes this is possible no it's not i need to trust their judgment and that takes kind of a long time you know many months and they need to be able to trust me too so you know that's that, that it's reciprocal the other thing that's really important is you, you really need to get along with them. You know, do you like them? Can you can you hang out? And somebody, a venture capitalist once said, well, it's the airport test. If you get stranded at an airport overnight, could you stand to be with them the entire time? And, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the best of friends, but you really have to have be able to have mutual respect and, 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 and at least, you know, be able to get along well because you're going to have to grow a big company. And if the two people or three people who are the co-founders don't get along, then it'll never work. You have sold multiple companies. How do you go about creating the exit strategy to maximize profits? Well, you know, I will say that one of the things that is true of many of my companies is the biggest risk has always been, are we too early to market? Because we, you know, a lot of times, like with digital video, speech recognition, even, you know, some of the AI stuff we're doing, Body Labs is will the will the ecosystem around it develop fast enough that the, the thing you're creating is is, is going to have a high enough demand to actually have any value at all? So just for After Effects, which is like Photoshop for video, we did that. We you know, that was 1991, 92, 93 when we were creating that product, and you know everyone you know we're on we're doing video over over the internet now, and there's Netflix and there's Amazon and all this stuff. But back then, I mean you know, driving digital video over a network was unheard of, you know, so this is brand new stuff. And, we, you know, we didn't know how quickly that that market would take off. So the reason I bring that up is, I, you know, I think that's the key thing is we're being able to at least assess, being sober in your assessment about how much value do you have now and, and, and where's the overall market going and how fast can you grow the company. When we have sold companies, when I have sold companies, the assessment is that there will be more value for the shareholders by bringing this company into a 
bigger entity that actually either has, you know, can get the product out faster to the market or has the ability to, you know, kind of wait for the ecosystem to grow a bit more than, than a smaller company can do. So I think it's, it's really timing and, 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 and being able to present my companies um, to these bigger companies in a way that, that, that lets them understand where the long, longer term potential value is. How do you identify when to sell the company? And if you're getting offers all along, how do you know when to accept those offers? Usually um, at, at companies that, and, 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 you know, to keep in mind, these are, these are, you know, pretty deep tech companies that I've run where we always have to raise successive rounds of venture financing. You know, this isn't almost never have I run a company where, you know, after a little bit of initial investment, we get cash flow, we get profitable and grow on our own. These are companies that require lots of R&D, lots of long-term markets. So, so you have to convince investors that, that, you know, that, that they should put, invest in the R&D because the market will eventually come. And usually in, in, in those scenarios anyway, the, typically the time to sell companies, the opportunities to sell companies is when you're raising the next round of financing. So, you know, you might raise a seed round of financing and then another round and you might say, okay, now, you know, we built this, we built all of these things, but we still need to go raise more venture capital financing. And usually at that point, you take a look. And you say, well, if we've ra- you know, if we raise this next round of financing, that means we're going to have to sell the company or take it public for even that much more money later on. Do you think we can reach that next level of, of valuation? And, and how long will that take? Or is it better right now, rather than going and taking more money and building ourselves, to sell to a bigger company that's willing to pay, pay a premium right now? And, and that's a judgment call. But I have to say, in most cases, it's been pretty obvious which one, which way to go. You took SpeechWorks public in 2000. The stock tripled its value. It did momentarily, and then it and then it got killed. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs considering going public? I, I might just, you know, we took SpeechWorks public. It was also, I mean, we were very, very fortunate to be able to do it at a time when it was a very frothy market. I mean, it was, it was. August of 2000, and it was an internet boom. And that was before the bust. So I feel compelled to tell your listeners that it tripled in value, more than tripled in value, actually. And then at one point, the stock was $100 a share. And at another point, I think the stock went down to $3 a share, you know, so over the course of a couple of years. So, you know, but it was the right call to make. You know, we, we, we went out, we got public because the market window opened up and there was demand and it, you know, a, a lot of the shareholders all did very well, at least the initial shareholders. The decision to go in public has a couple components. Um, one is just, can you do it? You know, is it like, it, is your company capable of going public um, given timing, give, given what your company is and the timing? So, and what I mean by that is, you know, right now there's a big demand for companies to go public. Investors want to own equity stocks. They're believers in, in, in these, a lot of these small companies, which haven't quite proven themselves to be profitable yet. You know, they're, they believe in the future. So the mentality's there, the capital's there and a lot of, and there's been a lot of capital to grow these companies privately as well. So, so one thing is just, you know, can you actually get it public? A lot of times, you know, that's, that's a market, um, a market issue that you really can't control. I think the, 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 the entrepreneur advice I'd give is like, is that, do you want your company to be public? Is that what you're driving for? Do you want to run a public company? And, and now if you've taken investment dollars and the, and the best investment outcome for your investors is to go public, then you probably owe it to your shareholders to take the company public. But the question you'd ha- I'd have for an entrepreneur is, do you want to run a public company? Because running a public company is, is, is a lot different than running a private company and is a really lot different than running a very small startup. You know, it comes with a lot of a lot of responsibilities. There's a lot of there's a lot of administration. There's a lot of overhead. There's a lot of headache. And I I I you know personally, I'd much rather run a five person company than a five thousand person public company. I mean, I just you know, it's 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 it's, it's a different it's a different job. So is that the job you want? And I think the advice I'd give is just to reflect. You know, is that is that what's going to make you happy? 
<laughs> and if not, you know, if not, and your company's a, a good public company, then then hire a CEO to take it public. You know, you don't have to you don't have to be the one to take it public. What education will best prepare someone to become a tech entrepreneur? Again, you know, if you're talking about when you say tech entrepreneur, then you know that that definitely does imply that that, that you need to know something about technology. I, I would suggest that knowing what problem you want to solve is equally important. So, you know, you, you know, coming out of industry, but, but I think maybe that the, the, if you don't mind me saying a slightly different question is what quality kind of, what qualities or what education helps you become an entrepreneur in general? I, I, I always wonder, Daniel, whether, I mean, you need a good education, right? I mean, like, you know, you need to finish high school, go to college. If you want, you know, go to graduate school and, and, and you know, that's like, educate, you know, a fundamental education is important, but, but I think entrepreneurialism is many times much more about personality than it is per se about education. It's, um, I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, you sort of told me a little bit about what you've been doing yourself and, and, and I, I look at that as, you know, it feels to me like you have the personality of an entrepreneur. You've started your business uh, club. You've started these things. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm maybe, emblematic of this, you know, growing up, I, I never like really had a, from high school on, I, I never really had a job where I worked for somebody. I, I, in the summers, I owned a, a, a clam boat and I, I, you know, which is, I would go out and collect clams and that was my summer job. And then uh, I guess it, it, I always had a job and I was always selling something. And in law school, I started the, you know, with a very good friend of mine, um, the, the, the Harvard Law School Human Rights Journal. So I was always starting stuff, you know, and I was always kind of hustling. And I think that, you know, the desire to see something new happen is, is in many ways a, a personality thing more than an education thing. So, and, and that does, it's neither good nor bad. You know, some people, and I say this about working at a startup too, some people really love the environment of a startup where, you know, one day you're doing one thing and another day that, you know, you're, you get new information, you have to change and, 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 and you have to do lots of different things. Some people are really energized by that. Other people get freaked out and don't like it at all, but they like to, you know, focus on one thing and do it really well and, you know, get really deep into it and, 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 and don't like to have it change a lot, which is also good. I mean, you know, these are both sort of, these are neither good nor bad. They're just like, you know, knowing what your personality is. I think is probably a bigger issue about whether you're cut out to be an entrepreneur and then whether it's a tech entrepreneur, uh, you know, and you know, wh whatever your company is, 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 is probably a little bit more about your, what you know about and, and, and what interests you than per se, what your education is. What are the factors that contribute to making the startup successful? It almost always ends up being about the people, good, smart, flexible, listening people. How do you handle the risk that comes with being on the frontier of innovation? The risk that I find the most stressful and how do I deal with it is having a lot of people, you know, put their money and their time and their faith into this company. And then all you can do is just work as hard as you can and be as honest as you can with everybody. Would you bring venture capitalists on board if you didn't really need their money? When there's just a huge market opportunity, even if you don't need the money and you're profitable and you can grow slowly, there might be a reason to just take capital in order that you can really grow fast and be the market leader. Based on your experience advising startups, what are the factors that contribute to making a startup successful? Uh, you know, I think it, it almost always ends up being about the people. You know, you'd like to say, is it a good idea and is it a big market, right? Because those are... Those are two things that are eventually going to be the most important. But a lot of times, you know, you'll find that idea you have, the, the problem, you know, you're trying to solve, solve a problem. Maybe you've misidentified the problem or maybe you've got the right problem, but you didn't have the right solution or the market that you thought might grow faster isn't growing fast enough. So the, those, you know, having a, a, a good idea and a good market eventually are very important. You'd like to have them the very first day, but because, you know, a lot of times you just don't know as much as you think you do having really good, smart, flexible people um, who listen, I think is the most, is the most important thing. So, so it's, it's about the people 
And I think it's about people who are and uh, smart, listen well, take take advice really well, and and when I say listen well and take advice well, are willing to change their minds based on new information that they hear and understand and advice that makes sense to them. Um, and that requires, I think, flexibility and, 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 and enough self-confidence in your own intelligence to know that when somebody has given you information that, 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 you know, that, that you can change your mind. With good information, you can change your mind. So good, smart, flexible, listening people <laughs> is, I think, if you have that set of folks, even if you start with an idea that's not as good as you thought or as a market that's not as good as you thought or both, you can navigate and, and the current word is pivot to, to, to something based on, 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 you know, on what you hear and, and how you react. Looking ahead, which areas of technology do you expect to offer the most opportunity for startups in the coming years? I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably say things that are, you know, what everybody else would say. So I, I think that's always hard to, to say things change. I mean, you know, I remember in the nineties, and, you know, before the turn of the century, everyone thought technology had peaked. And then there was this thing called the internet that happened. And all of a sudden, you know, it all changed. So, so I, you know, there are lots of things that we can't anticipate, but certainly, I mean, you know, artificial intelligence, broadly speaking, is, is beginning to penetrate many different markets. I think lots of stuff's going on with blockchain, maybe not just cryptocurrencies, but blockchain and tokenization and decentralization. I think those are big trends. I also think, I hope for your sake, um, for the sake of the eighth graders and, 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 and others in your generation, that this climate change stuff really starts to accelerate. You know, I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of good technology. There was a, I, I think there was a moment about 10 or 12 years ago when, you know, there's a lot of interest in new, new green technology, shall we call it, Many of which were, were were pretty immature, and I think you know there were there were um, some disappointments there. Like so much in technology, you know that first wave is sometimes you know it's it, it's the right ideas, but but the technology hasn't advanced or the ecosystems haven't advanced. I think we're beginning to see that you know now in this wave, particularly with all the money and all the interest and the dire need for these technologies, that a lot will happen in climate change, climate technologies, green technologies. And, you know, I don't know if that's in solar or wind turbine or ocean or, you know, uh, water or, or waste, but I think, uh, I think we'll see a lot of stuff there. I, I, I just don't know those things very well or well enough to really give a more granular or more specific um, set of, you know, um, prognostications. So how do you handle the risk that comes with being on the frontier of innovation? I, I, I do a lot of exercise to reduce the stress. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I think risk is a matter of perspective. Um, it depends. What do you think? What does one think is a risk? Right. So so people think that that the fact that a company might not succeed is a big risk because they're worried that they're not going to have a job. Now, I understand that. And certainly anybody I hire, you know, whenever I'm doing employment things, I always say, look, you know, I don't know if this company is going to make it. We've raised this much money. I know we have, you know, enough money to run the company for two years. So I'm pretty sure we can pay you for two years. But after that, you know, I'm, we're hopeful that things will continue, but we just don't know, or, you know, you can't count on it. But the reality is you go to many companies and you, and even big companies, and you just don't have that much control over whether you're going to get fired or not, you know, whether the company is going to do well. So losing a job is not necessarily, if that's what you're worried about, if that's the thing you're, 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 if that's the risk you're worried about, then, you know, it's not clear to me that, that some, that startups are actually all that riskier than big companies, at least funded startups. If the risk is, you know, if I do, if I work on this project, and it doesn't work, then I've lost an opportunity to work on something else. I think the opportunity cost, as they call it, you know, is something to be aware of or cognizant of. But it also, I guess, is a question of, well, 
what opportunities do you think you're missing? You know, if, if, um, you know, if it's an opportunity to start another company, okay, well then in that case, you just really need to sort of, um, do as much research and, 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 and investigation as you can to make the best decision you can based on incomplete information. You'll never have enough information to know for sure that something's going to work or not. But if the risk is, um, you know, I, I, I can either start this company or I can go work for a big bank or something. To me, that's not, that's, you know, you, that's not a comparison you can make. Like, like, those are two different experiences. And I, I think there is, is, is what's the experience that's going to make you happier or it's going to be more fulfilling to you. Even if you fail at a startup, that might, that, that effort might feel more rewarding than succeeding at a big company, you know? So I think it's a lot of personal decision-making. Um, I think, and, and then I, I guess finally, I, you know, to me, the risk, the, the risk that I find the most stressful and how do I deal with it is, is, is having a lot of people. And I mean, by that mostly, you know, employees, but also investors, you know, put their money and their time and their faith into this company. Um, and then all you can do is just work as hard as you can and be as honest as you can with everybody about what's happening and let them kind of make their own decisions about, how, how confident they are, it's going to move forward. And I think once you've done that, you've done all you can, and then you just got to work hard. When you started Body Labs, you could have said that there were 999 successful real estate agents in New York. So if you become the thousandth one, you could probably be well off too. So how do you compare doing something that 999 people are already excel at versus doing something completely new? you just made the better argument than i did like do you want to uh, you know do you want do you want to sell real estate or do, you know like i and I, you know do you like how much of of what we're doing at any one of these companies turns you on like does how, how excited are, are you about what we're doing and that's a couple of different things you know one is what's the what's the technology and the market you know what what, what are we trying to build here like, does that interest you? And that's what, when I was saying earlier, you know, is it cool? Like if you're doing cool stuff, if you're doing, you know, video editing, if you're doing AI for, you know, the, uh, for, for body modeling, if you're doing speech recognition, you can get people excited about how cool it is. Right. Um, and then the other thing is like, Hey, you know, this is, you get, you have an opportunity to build something here. You know, you're, you're the fourth, you're the eighth, you're the, hundredth employee at a company that could be you know really big doing cool stuff what you do here every day is going to really matter you know there's going to you're going to be able to see a really direct relationship between the cause and effect of your presence at this company um you know every day you you will have to make a decision is this going to help you know it's going to help the company a little bit. Is this the right thing to do? And you're going to own a piece of the company. We're going to give you stock options and look at the people around you. You know, do you like them? This is the team we're building. Like we want to have a good team. We want to have a diverse, um, fun, um, uh, uh, a respectful environment. Um, we want, you know, we want you to go out and hire people who, who, who have the same values. So you get to build, it's not only about, is it cool? And do you love what we're doing? And that's important, but it's also about here's the organization you get to be a part of and you get to build and, and you and you get to influence how it grows. And is that important to you? You know? Um, and, 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 you know, you'd like to think that's important to everybody. Some people are like, you know what? I've got, um, I, you know, I got $200,000 of college loans right now. Um, I, 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 I just got to go make a lot of money and I, I need to take a more reliable job to do it. And I'm like, fair enough. You know, I, we can't pay you that much or, you know, your stock options might be worth millions someday, but I can't guarantee it. And if you need, if you need to do that, you know, cool, I get it. That's, that, that's fine. Um, so I, you know, that, that's the kind of conversation I have uh, with, with folks. What were the biggest lessons you learned over the decades by building startups? Well, I'd say I'd try not to mis make the same mistake more than three times. 
Um, <laughs> I think if I make a mistake, um, uh, some one 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 guy said, "What was his what the line he said?" Because um, I'll never make that mistake for the third time again. Um, that that has become my line. I, uh, um, I, I I think that um, the biggest lessons are well. First of all, I think you learn a lot more from your mistakes than from your successes. Um, uh, you know, the, your your very lovely introduction um, did not include you know many uh, of the efforts that I've had, both as a, as, you know, a startup guy, as well as an advisor of companies that just failed, um, you know? Um, and I, I think that this, I guess, maybe to try to answer your question directly, um, I think that never, um, you know, I, never take anything for granted, you know, never, I, like, I feel like I have a lot of experience now, but, I think that um, it's important to look at each new opportunity, each new company, um, and 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 make sure that that you're not fooling yourself. That 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 just because something you've succeeded before, don't be don't be arrogant. I guess is maybe don't be arrogant. You know, be humble. Um, ask questions, assume you don't know a lot, assume sometimes you don't know anything and, um, and, 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 and just don't be, don't be arrogant. <laughs> How has your experience with venture capitalists been? Would you bring them on board if you didn't really need their money? If I didn't need outside funding, I wouldn't, generally get it i don't and, and that has nothing to do with you know whether venture capitalists are good bad or you know otherwise i mean i don't know why you would take outside investment if you don't need it because you're just diluting yourself and you're you're, you're taking value from yourself and your partners and your your employees now that said there are sometimes even if you don't need it need it like you're you're a profitable company there are some times when you want to take outside investment and venture capital investment, most particularly, I think when, well, the same, it's sort of the same thing as when there's just a huge market opportunity that you can get into much faster and be a much bigger company in the long run. Even if you don't need the money and you're profitable and you grow slowly, there might be a reason to just take capital in order that you can really grow fast and be a, be a very big company very quickly and be the market leader. And if you're a market leader, you always get a premium for your, your, your company is always valued a premium if you're the market leader. The reciprocal of that is you may be a profitable company doing reasonably well, but one of your competitors has just raised a boatload of money and they're going to rush into this market and they're going to beat you to all that business because you don't have the capital. So even if you're profitable and don't quote need the money, I think those are two reasons why you want, might want to take it. Otherwise, I'd say, no, why, you know, why take why take outside investment? It's a lot of pressure and, you know, you don't need the headache. My experience in venture capitalists has been by and large, pretty good. I, you know, I think venture capitalists can really help. Um, I do think it's very important that everyone have an alignment of expectations and interests. Um, and I mean that for employees, co-founders, investors, if everyone is on the same page about what the company is trying to do, how it's going to do it and why it's doing it, that's fine. It's when expectations get out of line, either, you know, the investors think the company's, you know, should be worth way more than it is right now, or the investors, you've, you've, told the investors you're going to do one thing and then you do another and you know you haven't haven't um squared that with them you know that's when expectations get misaligned um that's when things get really troublesome so i think it's important again this goes back to my communication point i think you communicate very clearly what you're trying to do if they're if they want to put money in your company and get you to do something else and you don't want to do that don't take the money you know the other thing I think that is a little bit harder to find, and I've had a couple of, you know, times this has been an issue, personality. Sometimes, you know, 
sometimes you just get jerks. Um, and that that's true of across the board, but, you know, sometimes you just get, you know, arrogant people, people who don't listen very well, people who have something to prove that has nothing to do with your particular company. So, you know, you gotta be, I think just trying to make sure you get along with the investors is important. Um, and, you know, I'm a pretty affable guy. I get along with most people, but, you know, occasionally <laughs> um, you get some people who are, who are just not as affable or, or, or you know, who are hard to uh, get along with. Um, so that, that's, that's a, an mm -hmm. ingredient you don't want to overlook. Do you give stock options to your employees to get everyone on the same boat? Yeah, well, so, so, so yeah, I think that that helps a lot, right? So at all my companies... All the employees get stock options. Um, and we try as much as possible, as you may, may know, when you sell stock to venture capital investors, they, they get different classes of stock. They get preferred stock. So, so what happens is usually the founders and the employees get what's called common stock. And then when you sell shares to investors, they get stock in the company, but it has certain rights that necessarily the common doesn't have. And none of that matters if you sell the company or you take it public because everybody converts to common. But it's important, I think, to keep those, the rights and privileges they get as preferred stock as close to the common stock as possible. So, so that's the financial way of aligning interests. Everyone has stock in the company. Everyone's trying to make that stock valuable. Everyone moves along. Um, so yeah, we definitely do that. But I also mean when I say aligning expectations and, and, and incentives, I guess I should have said that as well. So, so, so everyone having stock aligns incentives. Um, everyone's trying to make, you know, do the same thing. And that's, that's a good point. I should have mentioned that earlier. But I think also aligning expectations mean, hey, here's what the company's trying to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here are the people we're going to hire to do it. Here are the programs we're putting in place to make it happen. Um, here are the products we're developing, you know, being able to communicate that and having everyone say, yeah, we're, we're all in agreement. That's the way to align expectations as well. So it's expectations and incentives. We have come to the end of today's discussion, which I found very useful and highly enjoyable. On behalf of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society, Professor Bill O'Farrell, thank you very much for speaking with me today. You know, the pleasure's all mine. I'm really quite impressed with, with you and the organization, and I wish you guys all the luck, and please let me know if I can be of help anytime in the future. Mm -hmm.